The easiest way to learn retinoscopy is to use a refractor or foropter with a so-called schematic eye mounted behind. For example, this schematic eye from the Brunel Corporation is easily positioned and taped on the examining chair, keeping it pointed straight ahead. The spherical refractive error, that is, the amount of nearsightedness or farsightedness, myopia or hyperopia, can be adjusted by moving this back portion in or out according to a scale marked on the device. Astigmatism can be added to the schematic eye with a cylindrical trial lens, and this will be done to create unknown refractive errors for practice purposes later. This Copeland Rynex schematic eye from Benson Optical Company can be used if it's first rotated 180 degrees, with cylindrical lenses being taped on the back of the foropter. The whole point of the neutralization technique of retinoscopy is to use lenses to bring the eye's far point to the peephole of the retinoscope held at the normal working distance. Adding plus lens power, dialing down on the foropter, pulls the far point toward the eye. Going in the minus direction, dialing up on the foropter, moves the far point away from the eye. The far point can be moved beyond the retinoscope to infinity and even beyond infinity by continuing to dial up on the foropter. The far point beyond infinity is actually a virtual far point behind the eye. How does one know where the far point is? By the movement of the retinoscopic reflex. If you see with movement, the far point is beyond the retinoscope, and plus lens power is added to pull the far point into the position of the retinoscope. If you see against movement, the far point is between the foropter and the retinoscope, and the lenses are changed in the minus direction by dialing up to move the far point out to the retinoscope. When the far point reaches the retinoscope, the reflex becomes neutralized, filling the whole pupil and no longer moving. Dr. Guyton will look at a reflex and move the far point around by changing the lenses. Here's with movement. The far point must be beyond the retinoscope. That says add plus, dial down on the foropter to pull the far point inward toward the retinoscope. As we add plus, notice that the reflex becomes broad and has less distinct margins. It also speeds up as we approach neutralization. The far point is approaching the peephole of the retinoscope. Neutralization is not a sharp, distinct point. There is a zone of neutrality in most eyes at least half a diopter wide, or at least two clicks of sphere power on the foropter. This is sometimes called the dead zone, where neither with movement nor against movement can be distinguished with certainty. As we continue to add plus, the far point is pulled in front of the retinoscope and against movement appears. Against movement tells us, of course, that we need to change sphere back in the minus direction to dial up on the foropter to get back to neutralization. Remember, with movement tells you to change sphere in the plus direction, to dial down on the foropter. Against movement tells you to change sphere in the minus direction, to dial up on the foropter. It's really very straightforward. So far, the examiner has remained at the normal working distance and has moved the far point about by changing the lenses in front of the eye. Once the far point is in the vicinity of the retinoscope, however, the zone of neutralization can be examined very precisely by moving forward and backward, like so. If you move forward inside the far point, the far point now falls beyond the retinoscope, and you will pick up with movement. The farther forward you move, the more pronounced the with movement becomes. By your moving back beyond the far point, the far point comes to fall between the foropter and the retinoscope, and you'll pick up against movement. The farther you move back, the more pronounced the against movement becomes. As you move forward again, you'll move through the dead zone and pick up with movement once more. By this to and fro movement, you can exactly locate the front edge of the dead zone, where only minimal with movement remains. This is generally the best endpoint. With movement is easier to detect than against movement, and whether you move to the far point or bring the far point to the retinoscope with lenses, the best endpoint is leaving a little with movement. 
Now it's time to retinoscope an eye with an unknown spherical error. First, set the schematic eye to an unknown spherical value without looking at the scale. Then position yourself at the normal working distance and dim the lights. Be sure to hold the sleeve on the retinoscope up and look for with or against movement. Here's with movement. That's easy. We dial down to add plus until just a little with movement remains. That's too far. Back one and we're done. Here's another unknown spherical error. Now there's against movement to start with. The first thing to do here is to dial up. Go in the minus direction until we convert the against movement into definite with movement. Then we dial down as slowly as before until just minimal with movement remains. To be sure the end point is correct, we can move a few centimeters forward, see the increased with movement, and then a few centimeters backward, getting into the dead zone or even seeing a little against movement. This to and fro movement is the mark of a skilled retinoscopist. To be sure you're leaving the right amount of width movement, ask an experienced retinoscopist to check the appearance of the reflex. You should neutralize a series of unknown spherical errors in this way before proceeding further. That's all there is to neutralizing spherical refractive errors with retinoscopy. Unfortunately, there is such a thing as astigmatism, and practically all eyes have at least a little astigmatism. Astigmatism requires a cylindrical lens for its correction, for the refractive error is different in different meridians. Each astigmatic eye has two principal meridians at right angles to each other, having the greatest and least refractive power. Each principal meridian can be thought of as having its own far point. So to neutralize astigmatism, we have to move two far points to the peephole of the retinoscope. We'll first use spheres to move one of the far points to the peephole, then we'll use a cylindrical lens to move the second far point to the peephole. The orientation of the cylinder is critical, though, and we first have to locate the principal meridians to know where to place the cylinder axis. Here's where our streak retinoscope is most useful, in locating the cylinder axis, as opposed to the older type of spot retinoscope. Let's give some astigmatism to the schematic eye. Place a minus one and a half diopter cylinder between the schematic eye and the four-opter with axis approximately vertical at about 100 degrees. So the proper correction will be a plus one and a half diopter cylinder axis 100 degrees. Dim the lights and look for with or against movement. This time not only holding the sleeve all the way up, but also rotating it with thumb and forefinger to change the streak from one meridian to another as you sweep the intercept across the pupil. Note that the reflex is different in different meridians, indicating the presence of astigmatism. Here is with movement, for example, and here is against. The first step is to get with movement in all meridians by dialing up on the foropter in the minus direction. This against movement is what we want to convert to with, so we'll dial up until definite with movement. Now there's with movement in all meridians as we check around. The next step is dialing slowly back in the plus direction until we neutralize the first meridian that neutralizes. The reflex is broader in the horizontal meridian, so we'll concentrate on that reflex. There. Just a little width movement remaining. Now the vertical meridian has the most remaining width movement, indicating the axis of the plus cylinder that we'll need. Here is the only place that you should ever lower the sleeve in the neutralization technique. If there is more than one diopter or so of astigmatism, you can enhance the reflex, making it narrower and brighter, by adjusting the sleeve downward. Notice that both the intercept and the reflex become narrower and brighter as we seek the position of the sleeve, giving the best enhancement. Enhancing the reflex serves only to help locate the cylinder axis with better precision, and you should never attempt to neutralize the reflex when it is enhanced. If the reflex will not enhance, return the sleeve to the extreme up position. With the reflex enhanced if possible, we will now examine the various phenomena that help us locate the cylinder axis. First, the break phenomenon. Note that when the intercept is off axis, the reflex is no longer parallel to it. There is a break or misalignment of the reflex with the intercept. As we rotate the streak on axis, the reflex becomes parallel to the intercept. 
Thus, the break phenomenon, when present, tells us there is astigmatism and that we're off axis. Also note that when the intercept is off axis, the reflex becomes thicker and usually less bright. That is, the reflex appears less enhanced. Thus, the best enhancement of the reflex occurs when we are on axis. The last phenomenon, the skew phenomenon, is most helpful with low amounts of astigmatism. We'll temporarily correct most of this astigmatism to demonstrate the skew phenomenon. Now the desired axis is still roughly vertical, but there is no longer enough astigmatism to give a decent break phenomenon. Note instead the apparent direction of movement of the reflex with respect to the direction of movement of the intercept. If the intercept is off axis, the reflex moves in a skewed direction with respect to the intercept. If the intercept is on axis, the reflex and intercept move in exactly the same direction. The skew phenomenon is thus a dynamic clue to the axis location, whereas the break and enhancement phenomena are static clues. Again, the skew phenomenon is most useful in low amounts of astigmatism when the other phenomena are less evident. In actual practice, we don't think of these separate phenomena when locating the axis. They all blend together with experience. Now that we have located the axis, we rotate the cylinder axis of the phoropter parallel to the streak with the greatest width movement. This remaining width movement is neutralized by adding plus cylinder power, turning the cylinder knob clockwise on this Reichert phoropter. There, just a little remaining width movement. Check the horizontal meridian to see if it's still neutralized, and we're finished with the gross neutralization. Each principal meridian is neutralized. Many retinoscopists stop at this point and proceed to subjective refinement of the refraction. It's good practice, though, to refine the cylinder axis and power retinoscopically first, for such refinement is easy and fast with the streak retinoscope. Let's leave a little axis error and power error so we can demonstrate these refinement steps more easily. For both refinement steps, we need definite width movement in all meridians so we lean a little forward, a few centimeters, to obtain it. First, we refine axis. Having moved in to get width movement in all meridians, we use what Copeland called the straddle cross. We check the reflex 45 degrees on either side of the correcting cylinder axis. If there is an axis error, the reflex will be narrower and brighter, showing better width movement in one of these directions. Here, this occurs 45 degrees counterclockwise to the axis. This narrower, brighter reflex is called the guide line, and the plus cylinder axis should be rotated a few degrees toward it. The straddle cross is checked again, and the axis refined further if necessary until the reflexes 45 degrees to either side of the axis are equal. Refinement of the cylinder axis using the straddle cross is recognized as one of the most accurate steps in retinoscopy, and as you see, is both easy and fast. Next comes final refinement of the cylinder power. Again, we move in a few centimeters from the normal working distance to pick up definite width movement in both principal meridians. Now we use what Copeland called the power cross. We compare the width movement in the two principal meridians back and forth as we slowly move backward to the normal working distance. Here we see that the width movement is unbalanced between the two principal meridians that we need more plus power to neutralize the streak in the vertical meridian. The vertical meridian is parallel to the cylinder axis, so we need to add more plus cylinder power to decrease the width movement. Like so. We check the power cross again. This time it appears balanced, and it stays balanced as we move slowly outward to the normal working distance. That completes the neutralization of this astigmatic eye. You should repeat the procedure using different amounts of simulated astigmatism and have an experienced retinoscopist check your neutralization of the reflex. Don't trust the refractive scale on the schematic eye and don't even expect to get a cylindrical correction exactly opposite to the trial cylinder you added behind the phoropter. For the two lenses are separated and this can make a difference. Also note that except for clearing the cylinder power initially, we have not yet had to pay any attention to the actual sphere and cylinder powers in the phoropter. Instead, we know which way to turn the dials and knobs by the type of reflex we see. 
The actual lens powers are not important until it comes time to record the results. You're not yet ready to record the results though, or even to move on to subjective refinement with a patient, for the eye's far point is still at the working distance. That is, the eye is still focused at the position of the retinoscope. To move the far point to the far wall, or essentially to infinity, you must change the sphere one and a half diopters in the minus direction. Again, there's no need to look at the numbers. Simply dial six clicks up. If your working distance is shorter than normal, you may find that seven clicks up gives you best visual acuity. Instead of compensating for the working distance by changing the sphere dial, the auxiliary setting R on the Reichert 4 opter brings in a retinoscopy working lens of plus one and a half diopters. This is dialed in at the beginning of the retinoscopy and simply removed at the end. Many retinoscopists prefer not to use this extra lens for it increases the number of reflections to worry about. Once neutralization of the schematic eye is mastered, it is time to turn to real patients with real eyes.